in base model for the disease. So let me just review very quickly what we know so far. And to start with, we discussed the general context of infectious diseases, and we went on to talk about the SIR and related models, and then discuss compartmental models summarized in the equations over there. And these are formulated in terms of ordinary differential equations for people in each compartment. To generalize that a little bit, we went to the idea of metapopulation, and then we discussed diffusion and the fact that with diffusion you could have wave-like solutions that propagated by which you have an infected front that moves through a population. And that was our very preliminary, these two, the metapopulation idea and the diffusion idea, were two very preliminary ways of trying to generalize the conventional SIR model to include some sort of spatial structure. So to remind you again, the SIR model is a purely deterministic model. It has no spatial information in it at all because it's just a system of ordinary differential equations. It's a very coarse-grained approach that ignores all of the details of the individuals in the S compartment or the I compartment or the R compartment. There's no information there at all. It's just the number of individuals there, irrespective of how different they are in terms of the disease, or susceptibility to the disease and so on. And the last important point is a certain assumption that is snuck into the modeling, which is a mean field assumption. That is, everyone is perfectly mixed. Every individual has equal probability of interacting with any other individual and so on. So these leave some fundamental questions unanswered. For example, how do you incorporate stochasticity? We discussed this a little bit earlier, even in the context of the SIR model, but still only really in numbers. So it was just the fact that someone may or may not be infected at a particular time, given a particular time interval Vt. But you could, there are many, many other sources of stochasticity. For example, the probability that two individuals meet each other is a stochastic event. There is no spatial information in the earlier model. We want to try and figure out how to put the spatial information. On all in all, what we would like to do is to move from a very coarse-grained approach, summarized in the earlier equations here, to a more fine-grained description where we can have the freedom to incorporate more and more levels of detail as we go along. So what I want to talk about is two ways of approaching this problem. The first is in terms of networks. So that's a typical example of a network that you see there. And the second is an individual or agent-based model. And this is an example from some movie. And often the way you do these visualizations nowadays is the sort of CGI that goes into it is just to simulate many of these things as agents with specified properties and then let the simulation run. And then convert that into images that you can then convert transfer into a movie. So this approach of individual based modeling to generate very high quality detailed CGI images of very, very large numbers of entities in this case is a sort of fairly recent phenomenon in this field. Let me give you some motivation for thinking about networks. So a lot, in order to fix the terminology, a lot of the discussion will be about networks and then different types of networks, a small world network, etc. But there will be a large part of this that really deals with definitions of how to think about networks and how to define quantities for networks. So there aren't as many applications in this lecture as I would have liked, but they'll all pile up towards the end when I talk both about one particular network application and two agent-based model applications. But here's an example of the or one of the original networks, which is the London Underground Transportation Network. And this is an old uh, underground is, is at least about 100, 150 years old by now. But by the 1920s, people were not using the London Underground in the way that was expected. And one reason was that people regarded a trip on the underground as being very complicated. This was a map of the underground, a real spatial map that shows you how complicated it is. And you know, if you looked at this map, it seemed as though changing, changing trains here in order to get to this point or this point might be a very complicated thing. And so this is just a uh, visual complexity that arises because you want to retain the spatial aspects of where stations are relative to each other. And these spatial aspects, you assume the train moves at a constant velocity, then the time that it takes to go from here to here is a fairly long time because these are well separated in space. But this was sorted out or simplified by a draftsman called Beck, who ignored all the geographical implications of a map like that. He focused on just the connection between stations, magnified the central region, brought in the faraway ones, and got the lines to run either sort of vertically or horizontally or at worst ten, uh, at a diagonal at a 45 degree angle. And this involved some amount of stretching and squeezing of all of this picture that was shown there. So that 
with that you get to what looks like a modern day London underground map, which is a much more geometrical object, it sort of looks much less intimidating than something like that. The distances are compressed in such a way as to make them smaller, but it does retain many important aspects of the original map, which is what is a particular sequence of stations, what is the station if you want to go from here to here, where should you change, which are the hubs at which you should change your trains and so on. That information is here. And this way of taking a map like this with one with a large amount of information that is both spatial or metric as well as details with the deals with the connections between different stations is called the topological properties. This way of thinking about a map just in terms of how points are connected concentrates on topological features of the map and not on what are called metric features that represent distances. The structure of a network is the fundamental topological property of the network. And when we want to talk about networks for public health and infectious diseases, we want to talk about people and the relationships between people. And these relationships can be of multiple types. For example, you can have emotional relationships, transactional relationships, contact relationships, sexual relationships, and so on. So, when you want to zoom in on understanding disease, networks relevant to disease, the networks you might be interested in, for example, might be contact networks, they might be transactional networks, for example, when you come physically to transact with one or more individuals in your family or outside, that implies a certain degree of closeness. If you were talking about sexually transmitted diseases, you would like to know about the sexual connections between the populations, the network, the links between individuals in the population at the sexual level. So, if you take a network that sort of generically looks like this, there are specific terminologies that are used by people in different areas. For example, in the network science people will call these points nodes and the lines between them links. In mathematics, these are called vertices and edges in the computer science literature. In social sciences, these are called actors and these links would be called ties. In physics, you might have sites and bonds between them. So, at some level, you have all of these terms are really the same. They just depend upon which particular community you belong to and at least some of these I might use interchangeably as I go on. When you talk about networks for public health, the net, a graph, for example, is a combination of set of vertices and edges, where V is a set of vertices or nodes and E is a set of edges or links. So, there you can see a picture of the nodes with the links identified and a complicated set of vertices of nodes and links together give you a picture like this, which is called a graph. Okay. There are many types of architectures of networks that are possible. For example, here is a mesh, looks like a fishing, fishing net. That is the hub and spoke architecture where you have one central point and then connections out towards the outside. You can have a linear arrangement where basically you can move along a one dimensional path in order to get from any node to any other node. And then you can have a tree like arrangement where you have one sort of root which then branches out successively at higher orders. These are different structures that you can have for networks. So, when you think about networks in the context of public health, a person would be a node or a vertex, which is a single unit of analysis in the network. If all your nodes are of a single type, the data are said to be one mode. So, when you can have nodes of multiple types, for example, nodes could be students, it could also be classes, data are two mode or three mode or multi mode. If you cannot mix modes of the same type, then the graph is bipartite. For example, here are people here and there are the coffees that they prefer. So, Alice and Bob prefer Starbucks coffee and so does Charles, whereas Alice also likes the other Costa coffee, whatever that is on the other side. So, this separates into two types of, of nodes depending upon the fact that they do not mix within each other. You can assign other specific attributes to you nodes such as gender, age, occupation, various risk factors for the outcome. And these relationships between these nodes are edges and you can have many complex properties also assigned to the edges. A path on a network is a sequence of nodes that are connected by edges. So, for example, the path between here and here would involve having to go through this person, this person coming down and then winding up at that person there. A network, a graph is connected and between every pair of nodes, for example, this node and this node, there is a path that exists. So, there is a path here, for example, there is one path here there is another path. So, there must be at least one path. There could be multiple paths, but there must be at least one path between any two nodes in the graph. You can have the sense of direction. For example, the nodes that you have could
could be connected by edges that have arrows on them, which implies a relationship that is unidirectional between here and here or between here and here. So, if A acts on B, but B does not act on A, that can be represented in terms of a directed arrow going from A towards B. For example, a transaction such as loaning money involves a loaner and a loanee who accepts the money. But you can also have graphs that are undirected. For example, the graph that is shown here, where there are no arrows described explicitly. It is relationships between nodes that give links. You can, you can assign these links on many ways. One way is looking for some shared characteristic between them. This is called homophily. And similarity breeds connection is a way of describing how you might generate a network based on some common attribute. For example, all of them might read Time magazine on Friday, as an example, or all of them might take the same train to work. This would be a way of linking different, uh, different people, different nodes within the network. So, expanding one particular structure out. That would imply a link between this individual, all of these other individuals who are shown there. And the opposite of homophily is heterophily or intermingling. There are some important properties that have to do with the structures of networks, and one is called transitivity. And that is, it's for person A, B, and C. There will be an edge connecting A, B, A, C, and B, C. So if I know that A and B and A and C are connected, there is an enhanced probability that B and C will be connected to each other. So, for both homophily and transitivity, you be, this is this is a tendency to form triangles, implying a relationship. So, this is a triangle that says here that if two knows one and two knows three, this is increased probability that three knows one. In fact, represented as a link. So now these are all homophilic. But this is an intransitive network where the fact that three and two are connected and three and one are connected has nothing to do with the probability that two and one are connected. So, transitivity is the overall probability for the network to have adjacent nodes that are interconnected. And this property reveals the existence of tightly connected communities of clusters or subgroups of clicks. And what a way of assigning a numerical measure to this is to look at the ratio between the observed number of closed triplets and the maximum number of triplets that are allowable on that particular graph. And you can use the words transitivity and clustering in a somewhat similar way. So here is an example of various A, B, C, D, E for which you can calculate the number of existing triplets here. So there are no triplets here. This site is linked to single links to this, 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 although all of these additional links described by the dotted lines are also possible. So, here the transitivity is 0, the number of existing triplets is 0, number of possible triplets is 4, so dividing 0 by 4 gives you 0. If now you add one of these links, for example, in B, you have one triangle, but you leave the number of possible triplets again at 4, so that gives you an index of transitivity to be 0.25. And this way you can look at the fully connected network here, where you have all of these links present. So, you have 1, 2, 3, 4 triangles and you have the total number of possible triplets is 4, 4 divided by 4 is 1. So, 1 gives you the upper bound on the transitivity. So, the clustering coefficient represents the probability that two neighbors connected by an edge of a node are also connected. As I said, the tendency towards forming closed triangles. So, this if you think about this in a social sense, this represents the probability or the chance of a one individual's friends to be friends on their own. So, here is some measure here. If you can ask, again, this is you can get a clustering coefficient of 1 only if the neighborhood of a node is fully connected. So, if you ask what is the probability of the clustering coefficient between f for f, c, d, d, these are the numbers that actually turn up. So, if you wanted a number, this is 3 times number of triangles in the network divided by number of connected triples of vertices. So, this particular network that is shown has one triangle and eight connected triples, which you can just measure if you actually worked out exactly what is connected. And so, this has a clustering coefficient of 3 into 1 by 8, which is 3 by 8. So, you can look at the individual vertices having local clustering coefficients here and a mean clustering coefficient of 13 by of 13 by 30. Mm, is that correct? Okay, so this number is for this particular graph, the network that is shown. I'm not sure where the lower number comes from. Okay, to find the other quantities that relate to the graph, relate to distances between points on the graph. So here, between nodes, for example, three and five, or five and two, you can see that the element in the the, the index of the matrix that corresponds to that represents the distance, the shortest path between those two nodes. And to find the diameter of a graph, you find the shortest path between any pair of vertices. And then you look at the largest length of any of these paths, and that gives you the diameter of the graph. 
So, this particular example here has diameter equal to 4. So, components of a graph are those subset of nodes where you can connect every pair by a path and no path exists to network nodes that are not in that subset. So, for example, this gives you a graph that has two connected components. Everything here is connected, everything there is connected, but there is no path that takes you from this part of the graph to that part of the graph. So, here is an example of a graph with three connected components, a small one here, a somewhat larger one here and a largest component over there. So, there is no way of going from here to here. There are other measures in social networks that reflect the cohesion of a graph and that refers to the most important of these is the nodes degree which is simply how many edges it is connected to. So, this correlates to how many neighbors a node has where a neighbors where nodes neighborhood is only those that are directly connected to it. So, for example, let us look at this. There is only one node connected to this one. This has degree 1. This has degree 1 again. There are 5 nodes connected to this 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 that gives you degree 5. This is the most well connected point there which has 8 neighbors which you can enumerate by going across that. So, the node degree which is what we just calculated now for each node is occasionally called the degree centrality and it is used to, to infer how important nodes are in a particular network. And the simplest way of measuring the importance of a node is just to look at the degree. And if you have directed networks with arrows in there are there are generalizations of the idea to include both in degree and out degree. So, here is a node with degree 5, node with degree 2 and the more complicated picture that we just showed just now. You can generalize from here to a degree distribution. Look at the set of all degrees that you measured in a particular graph and this is for English Wik Wikipedia articles in out degree distribution of what articles quote what other articles and you can see that this has an interesting structure. It is not a flat object here and there are features of the degree distribution that are relevant to how natural networks are formed. You can ask given a network, you can ask about deeper properties of these, are these networks modular, are they sorted up? And modularity refers to how well you can separate a network into two modules or two or multiple communities. So, one way is just to sort of split it up into two parts and then break them up again until you cannot break them up anymore. So, here you can see this, this region is well connected, this region is well connected internally, but just by severing one bond you can now separate these two out. Okay. And it, these definitions are not absolute definitions because you can see whether you assign a to this or a to this is still um, it's it's a little it's it's um, not not completely prescribed to you. Assortativity is to what extent do nodes in the network associate with other similar nodes in the network. So this is every node couples to every other node pretty much in this random selection. This is highly assortative. Here each node talks only to a very small group of nodes in that particular structure. So, this is this is auditive. This is a property of the network that is a structural measure looking at the correlation and degrees between the pairwise nodes. And the way we would like to use this is to essentially study the modular structure of the network where you have individual nodes. You may have important nodes called hubs that connect to multiple modules. You can see the modular structure in this picture very easily. A good strong connection here, strong connections here and relatively weak small connections between these that can be severed by just cutting one of these links one of these edges between the modules. There are other measures for nodes in terms of how important they are to a network using measures of centrality and sen highly central nodes are those that have a large number of relationships or that are very important to the network in terms of the fact that if you cut them you can immediately break up the network into sub networks that do not talk to each other. So, once you can look at distances from node f for example, both c and d are a distance 1 b is a distance 2 from node m, 3, a is distance 3 from node f. Once you have these distances, you can define a characteristic path length, which is average distance to all other nodes, which you can just, if you look at node f, that sort of measures 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 divided by the total number, which is 1.75. And that represents how central a node is in the network. If you look at network length over here, an average path length, if you look at a network A that has a relatively small network length, and a large path length that is in terms of the number of bonds here. Look at network B or C that come in between here that has a somewhat larger network length, but the average path length has come down. And if you look at D, it is very easy to go from one point to another. So, the average path length is really it is pretty much the minimum the value that it can be, although the network length is much larger in terms of the number of edges or links. 
the last sort of idea that we use is something called the betweenness centrality. And that is a measure of, of a given vertex within the graph. And it quantifies the number of times a node acts as a bridge among the shortest path between two other nodes. It's a little more complicated than the definition we've used earlier. And here the colors, which is sort of red equal to 0 to blue equal to max. So this is the darkest. It says the largest between a centrality shows the node between this. So here is one example where you have a very high between a centrality in terms of this node mediating between this and this. And here you have another quantity we won't talk about. This is the best closest centrality and the highest degree centrality in terms of the number of neighbors that that particular node attaches to. So much of these definitions, in fact, there's a nice summary of these definitions in Newman's articles we use in modern physics. This is, we, this is what we've actually gone through, the vertex, the edge, directed, undirected, degree, component, path, diameter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are standard definitions in network science. And any reasonable review will have all of this information. The language may be slightly different depending upon whether you're looking at the social literature or the economics literature or the disease literature, but really they all mean the same thing. Okay. So let's look at some networks that are now understood to be increasingly important for disease. So the simplest is a lattice, where you have a bunch of points, all of which have essentially the same neighborhood in terms of degree. So this is connected to its neighbor. Think of this as really a circle, a set of points connected on a circle. So these can have connections or edges to its nearest neighbors. It can also have connections to its next nearest neighbors. For example, this is connected to this, this is connected to this, this is connected to this. Because the neighborhood of each of these, each of these nodes is the same, this looks very much like a regular, a completely regular network. It's called a lattice in this case. And over here is the same set of points where you have put in random links between that. There's the same probability of having a link between here and here as there is between here and here. So now, for example, you can have some of these links absent. There is no connection between this node and this node. But there is one between this and this. And this, in fact, moves to a node actually which is fairly far away. So, if you, a random network essentially has a probability of long range connections, whereas a lattice network is constrained by the fact that you only connect to nearby points. There is some internal measure, topological measure that says these points are near, these points are far, and I will only connect to the, the first set of neighbors, the second set of neighbors, etc., etc. So, the random network that we spoke about is actually a classic problem in theory. The, so the first random graph method was proposed by Erdős and Denny. It's called the ER network. And the, prop that, the idea behind that model is that these links here, these edges here, can occur with independent probability between any two nodes that you can have. So this is a small ER network that you can show. This is a, a very dense Erdős Denny network with lots of links between points. So unlike real networks, the difference, one difference between Erdős Denny and, and real networks is that there are usually no hubs in the Erdős-Renyi. That is, it's nodes which have, on average, a much larger number of edges than the average in the graph. But one other property that the erdős network has is the fact that you, you, as you increase the probability of connections between random points, at some sudden point, like percolation, you have the emergence of what is called a giant component, where a non-zero fraction of nodes can all be linked together. So as you reach as, as you reach this threshold, you have a larger amount of nodes becoming connected. And it's this giant component that allows for rapid transfer of information and of disease across the network. So the last example that I have is called a small world network. And the history behind this is the following. In the 1960s, a psychologist Stanley Milgram, a sociologist, set out to investigate how exactly people were linked in the real world. And what were the nature of relationships that connected one person to another person? So the idea was, a, was the, the implementation was a somewhat clever one. He handed out a set of envelopes to various numbers of people and instructed them to post it to someone that they didn't know. They, he assigned a certain target saying this, this is an envelope that is directed here. But you should not send it to there to that point directly. Send it to someone you know who is likely to be able to be closest to that particular point. So that you mail it to them. If they can't mail it, to, hand it in directly, they can mail it to someone else, until finally you have some route through multiple intermediate people for it to reach its final destination. So when the letters finally arrived, you could trace back and say who were the people that these letters actually went through. 
what were the sequence of intermediates and therefore what is the level of connection within the social network of the various individuals to whom these in these envelopes were first handed to who did they know and how many steps did it take did it take a thousand steps or a hundred steps or 50 steps or 10000 steps for the letters to reach their destination from the starting point so what's interesting about this data is it actually took only on average about six steps for the letter to reach the final destination this is popularized in the idea of called of called six degrees of separation or a small world that even though the, these experiments were done in the us with a population of about let us say 200 million at that particular time but the number six is nowhere near the 200 million so there is just being a the, the connections between people the fact that you can have very large links between an individual and another individual that is takes you much closer to your final point than you would normally have thought purely on a random basis this is called the the, the six degrees of separation of the small world phenomenon and it's popularized just saying that every person on the planet is about only six steps away from any other person so a network satisfies a small world property of the mean geodesic distance again the distances that we defined earlier between pairs of nodes is small relative to the total number of nodes and it should grow no faster than logarithmically as the number of nodes tends to infinity the logarithm is because there are some exact results for the small world networks that i will write down that show you that it should can go logarithmically at most and while the erdos any random graph uses a small world which you can typically travel between any pair of nodes using a small path however these are different from the sort of networks that you see in real life because they have very little clustering as the number of nodes tends to infinity so this was addressed by watson strogatz in a really classic paper about 20 years ago who said you can generate the topology of a small world network by taking a regular lattice and just rewiring adding some fraction of long range connections to that and that fraction could be very small it could be out of 1% or even less in order to have this property so here at the two extremes you have the lattice with no long range connection you have the random networks with lots of long range connection and small world sits on a lattice to which you add a small fraction of long range connection for example a connection that stretches all the way from here to here so these are networks with small world topology and they have some properties of the lattice they have some properties of the random network but like the lattice network they show substantial clustering clustering coefficients which are large but they have relatively short path lengths like the random so it's the best of two worlds phenomenon that the small world network shows so here are some more examples where you have both nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor and three neighbor right so this is what is a 1d lattice with connection separate by between all vertex pairs separated by k of fewer spacing k equal to 3 so nearest neighbor next nearest neighbor and next to next nearest neighbor is connected yes so that's a one dimensional lattice situation here is a small world that you get by connecting by removing one of those links and then connecting to a distant neighbor randomly and this is a variation in which you don't remove you don't dilute a link and then add it to them but you add in addition on top of the existing links some of these shortcuts between that connect nodes that are pretty distant away and this is the clustering coefficient that you show here so the clustering coefficient is high and this is the rewiring probability the probability of adding a link between two arbitrary chosen nodes you can see the clustering coefficient remains large as the mean vertex vertex distance goes off to zero so there is a substantial regime where you have strong clustering just like this situation here which you would get for p equal to 0 where the clustering coefficient is 1 and you have a situation where you have the distance between any two arbitrary nodes suddenly reduces over here if you have to go from node here to node here the only way you can do it or the best way you can do it is to skip three neighbors skip three neighbors etc etc which increases as you make your system your lattice size larger and larger and larger but the advantage of having these is that even if you have to make some skips you can take these la these shortcuts that enable you to sort of not to jump over many nodes that come in between in order to get to your final situation here so again this is a measure of of path lengths and clickishness in small world networks and the same same ideas here we have a rewiring probability and here you have both the, the, the clustering coefficient and the distance and here is implementation two dimension you take with two dimensional lattice that is connected both to nearest neighbors as well as to next nearest neighbors and on top of that you add some fraction of long range connections here and this is for example you could connect one all the way from here to that particular point and once you rewire you get these long range links so the central feature of the watts strogatz small world 
network is the fact that it has a large range of peaks that produces small world graphs with significant clustering. And it's this feature that looks most like social networks, which are significantly clustered. We do have a small group of people who we interact with, all of us, on a fairly regular basis. That defines our sort of local network structure. But we also have connections to people who, for example, stay very far away, but may still be connected to us on a personal level or involve physical contact between them. So this is how you go from, again, regular to random through random connectivity. Here are a bunch of examples of networks. For example, this is a network of contacts between 22 drug users over there. And B is a sort of an example of a snowball sampling. This is an example of cattle movements here, translated in the US, in the UK. And you can take data such as this and convert it into pictures that look like networks. Sometimes those networks may be dynamic, they may change in time. And you can use these network ideas to think about diseases on these networks and how they might propagate. There is another very important model which is which generates scale invariant degree distribution that is degree distribution that decay as a power law. These are dynamic networks where you introduce a rewiring at each step and your rewiring favors the rich getting richer. You tend to rewire more to nodes that are that have larger k's. Okay. And there are several examples. So these generate what are called scale free networks. There are several examples of these, for example, the citations of scientific publications follows the power law. Okay, so most social, biological, technological networks have very non-trivial topology. And it's the patterns of connection between their elements that are not purely regular and not totally random, as we saw in the case of the small world network. And here are those features. Those features are a, lo a long tail in the degree distribution, as in the, in the, in the Barabasi model, a high clustering coefficient, and a sort of or distortivity among vertices, the tendency to form little modules, a community structure, and hierarchical nature of these communities. And scale free networks, the small, small world networks, are both characterized by specific structural features the power law distributions for the former, and short path lengths and high clustering for the latter. So these are now understood to be fairly basic to thinking about diseases in a social and epidemiological context. That if you think about disease spread on a network in which the network is defined by how people interact with each other in a position to transfer diseases, then you have to worry about these somewhat more exotic versions of networks than the type of networks that you might just write down by connecting points to each other. They are neither purely random nor are they purely regular. They have features in between. So here is a sort of quick summary of, of what is known. That the degree variance is important in understanding how disease might spread. The role of super spreaders that are regions which are very highly connected, nodes which are very highly connected, is also very important in determining the, the, the spread of the disease. Very generically, diseases spread more rapidly on small world networks. So the threshold for spread, which is the analog of our R0 that we had, decreases rapidly with the reconnection probability. And if you look at the time it takes for infection, this also is nearly as short as sort of random graph. So this is probably bad news because if you argue that real social networks of interaction between people are well better modeled as small world networks, this says that the problem of controlling a disease on a network with that structure becomes much harder than you might naively have thought it might used to be. Okay, so now I want to get into some specific examples of networks, and this is one network example for SARS in the paper that I want to describe. This is a paper by Hufnagel, Brockman, and Geiser which is a PNS paper from 2004, and that looks at the worldwide spread of SARS. SARS is severe acute respiratory syndrome. It's a viral disease that spread around the early 2000s. The assumption here is that there is a local infection dynamics where an S and an I contract to give you two I's. This is just a standard SIR model, and the I recovers. So the I is removed from the population. Again, it doesn't matter. It's just this step that really is crucial for us, not the second step, as we know, because the that just sort of feeds away, takes away members from the infected population as they recover. What it puts in is local infection dynamics, the spread of infections locally following the SIR model, but it also puts in the ingredient that you have individuals who can travel long distances, and thereby that gives you this long range connection between different nodes. It has an element of stochasticity which they introduce by solving the master equation. These are again equations that we wrote down earlier. So these are how the probability for having a number s of susceptible individuals and number i of infected individuals behaves as a function of time t. 
and if you sort of look at this, this is the, what happens is the number of um, that this changes because infected people influence susceptible people. This is proportional both to the number of susceptibles and the number of infected. And this is how once this happens, susceptibility goes up by one, infection goes up by goes down. This is another term that enters here. These are all terms that you can later justify of how, how this particular object is structured. And we discussed equations like this when we talked about the Gillespie model. What they did here then was to look at all international and civil flights among the 500 largest airports. So, you can see some of these flights. This is a figure that is taken from their paper. So, you have flights that go all the way from East Asia to Europe to North America and connect all of the places. So they took these 500 most important airports then they divided the population to M local urban populations labeled I containing NI individuals and they did an SIR model for each of these. Then the way individuals moved around was described as stochastic dispersal of individuals defined by some matrix of transition probabilities between. So, you could have some individual moving from this population to another population here and this was combined with aviation network data. How important was, was each individual airport? You could get some idea of that by weighting the passenger traffic through that. If you know that one airport has sees 20,000 people per day traveling through it and another airport sees 200 people per day. In the airport that is larger and services more people will figure more importantly in determining the weightage of the links that connect that airport to another airport. So, this is A is the actual WHO model that tells you of how many cases at 0, less than 5, less than 20, less than 100, etc. So, this is a global representation of, of the spreading of, of probable SARS cases on May 30th, 2003. So, you can see the Chinese, it spread out from the Chinese here. There were, there were cases that were reported here as well as in Mexico and so on. And this is the simulation that they did. So, this is the network based simulation that they did representing essentially the same outcomes. And you can see that this actually does fairly well. It predicts that sort of this Australia remains unchanged, this part remains unchanged. But it captures the right distribution of colors here and here in terms of the number of cases. And they can even look at the actual numbers versus the simulation numbers. So, if for Hong Kong, the WHO on the 20th predicted 1718 and 1739. In the simulation, they found an average of 1951, which is certainly within any reasonable error bars. And they said, you, they ran the simulation multiple times, let us say a thousand times, to find out across different versions of the simulation what is the minimum number and the maximum number of cases that would actually be reported. And they did this for a bunch of other countries, and you can see that the systematics actually works out fairly well. So, this is one example, it is an old, somewhat older example of how you can use ideas such as how people travel between different points. You can use each of these airports as, as a node. The links between them relate to the travel between this point and that point. You can introduce stochasticities so that you have to now run this program many, many times and ask what is the average value, what is the fluctuation above that, what is the probability distribution. And the other thing that you can do is also influence, also introduce other factors. For example, if in a particular set of airports, particular set of locations within an airport, you immunize some fraction of the population, how effective would that immunization be in, in stemming? the spread of disease. When should that be done? Should that be done earlier or later? What is the fraction of population that you must immunize and so on. So, now let me, so that was just one example. There are many, many examples that I could have chosen, but I just chose one particular example because it illustrates reasonably well the features of network approaches to diseases. Typically, you have populations that are locally described by some sort of SIR, SIRS dynamics and you have links between those populations that are defined by the nodes, by the links between the nodes. These could represent air travel, direct contact, whatever it is. In this particular case, it looked at the importance of long distance air travel as a means for spreading and of taking a localized epidemic and making it a pandemic. But these ideas generalize apart from details to pretty much any way of thinking about disease spread. So, the second part of this talk is about individual or agent based models. And agent based models are ways of looking at it, looking at the problem from an even more micro perspective. So, in that case that I showed you, you had a population that was given by a homogeneous SIR model at the level of individual cities that were later connected. But now you could even choose to be even more micro than that and look at the level of single individuals. There are many advantages to this. First of all, the fact there are advantages and disadvantages. So, let me be clear about that. 
the advantage is that you can put in heterogeneities even at the level of individual agents, not just in how they are connected between is there a aircraft, is there a flight that flies between that airport there and this airport here and is there someone infected there who could potentially come here. So these agent based models are not, not new to infectious diseases, they have been used extensively. People use them a lot in transportation models but also in economic models when you want to represent a bunch of agents who interact with economic decisions or decisions based on personal profit using ideas from game theory. They are also present in social models but for example here you can ask how should you structure the transportation or structure the sequence of lights here so that vehicles that cross here can move in the fastest possible way including for example pedestrian traffic, how should you structure a stadium so that in the event of a fire or something that is an unforeseen eventuality you can evacuate faster. And then you can test these ideas about based on, on ideas from psychology about what individuals do when confronted with some sort of uh, some distressing event or something that they, if they need to feel the need to evacuate fast, how do they behave, what do they look at, how do they respond to other people around them, how is the panic communicated through a crowd, all of this can be done using agent based models. So the first step is to take the real system and convert it into an agent based model. So the real system might involve some geography here, individual people here and the first step is to abstract the agents from that background scenario. So from the entities here you transform them or translate them into agents and then the interaction between agents are trans in between these entities here for example the person here, the person here in this background is transformed into, int into an interaction between the agents. Even more complex model involve the interaction between the agents and the environment. So you could sit with with some GIS environmental data here, GIS social data about where the villages are, what the size of the population is and from here you get to the agents who could be farmers with some pest control knowledge and here from the environmental data you can generate a model for pests within this particular environment. Where are the pests, what is their cycle, how do they depend upon rainfall, fecundity, etc, etc. So this is a geographical context mixed with social data, a particular um, pest that has to be dealt with and people who are involved in dealing with that pest. So you can look at, so this particular paper looked at modeling of human induced spread of invasive species in agricultural landscape, in one particular example in South America. But this just, I'm just using this as an example to tell you that you can make agent based models more complicated, moving beyond just having agents which interact with each other to also looking at the background setting in which they are interacting as well as interacting, interaction with other agents. This gives models through some sort of cellular automaton. As I said, here is the other example of how you can use agents in very nice and very complex um, image processing of, of uh, if you want to do, if you, if you for, for a film for example, in which you do special effects. They can be simple agents, about boring agents, they can also be cleverer agents. A simple agent might just be something that looks at what is the world like now, decides an action to be taken and takes that action. And this is now the actions are hard coded in the description of the agents. But you could also have agents that learn. So one way of thinking about that is that, that the agent receives some input from the environment. It receives feedback about that input from something called a critic here. It learns from its interaction with the environment and then effects some action on the other side. So you can have both agents whose behavior is perfectly prescribed from the beginning that has given a certain input, they will act in a particular way. Or you can have agents that say that given a particular input, they will restructure their behavior in such a way as to modify that environment that created it as well as modify their own response. So an agent is actually a flexible object in, 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 a, in, a, in a philosophical sense. So you can have simple agents, complex agents, agents without goals or passive agents, you can have active agents with simple goals. You can have cognitive agents. Cognitive agents are agents who think about their input and then work to modifying the input that they are receiving. But roughly speaking, an agent in a multi agent system must have some of these properties. They must be autonomous, that is, their behavior is not perfectly prescribed. They, they do not see the whole system, they only see their local environment, so they only make local views. No agent has a full global view of the system. And the behavior of the agent is decentralized. There is no single external entity that specifies to all agents what they must be doing. This may look a little abstract to you but it makes sense in terms of the actual examples. If you look at the examples a little later, we will see how each of these definitions actually makes sense in that particular context. 
So, let me give you my first example and that is a modeling approach based on agents applied to the spread of cholera. So, here is a standard model for cholera. For example, here is the host, here is the environment and cholera is, is an interaction between the host and the environment. The host can go from being susceptible to exposed to infected to recovered ok. And if the host is susceptible to, in, to if once the host is infected, the host then excretes this for example, for feces, this adds to the water through rainfall or seepage and this is ingested in by, by the susceptible host. So, cholera is a water borne disease, it typically goes through some process of contamination of water which is addressed over here. The input to this is the rainfall. So, as the rainfall pattern changes, you can have cholera epidemics rising which is whenever there are always fears in the monsoon season of, of, of once you detect a few cases of cholera. So, this may potentially be an epidemic. So, that is how you would model this. Is, this is a standard SEIR model with the only change being that there is some input to these rates here that come from rainfall which assists this particular process of runoff and seepage. The cholera has been mainly eliminated in regions that provide clean water, hygiene and sanitation, but it remains a threat in parts of Africa and Asia. So, this is the model that looks at the spread of cholera in a particular refugee camp in Kenya, where you have large number of people together with in combination with poor sanitation and housing conditions. And what you do is to model the interaction of between humans and the environment using an SEIR model. And what you infer are certain results about how cholera spreads within that population. So, here is the data that they generate. If you start off with populations of different sizes, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000, here is the rainfall, the spikes in the rainfall as you get from an actual observation. And this is how exposed agents numbers go up, infected agent numbers go up in these in each of these cases and recovered agents also go, also go up. And using these models, you can try out with different base population structure in different locations what actually happens. So, this is again a sort of spatial computation since they now know who interacts with who in terms of these agents. This is what happened. This is the these three different camps, the Hagadera, the Ifo and the Dagahale camp. At different days, the number of, of uh, infected individuals were reported between 0, 4 to 7, 19 to 25, which can then be compared to actual data. So, here is the model for spatial model that they have for these three different locations and the connection between them. So, there is a as I said in my earlier example, there is also a spatial component to who interacts with who on these things. I am going to spend a little more time on this example, which is a different example, which is a historical the use of agent based model to study some historical phenomena. In this case, it is a community called the Norway House community in Manitoba, Canada to the fur trapping community and how it re, how it responded to a 1918 influenza epidemic. So, in 1918 if you remember this is the time when the first world war ended and that coincided with a serious pandemic influenza. In fact, it is serious enough that something like about 50 million people are believed to have died. What you may not know so much is that India was severely affected by this pandemic although that is not a fact that is usually sort of much known in the literature. Again, typically being carried by people who went to fight and then return back to their to homes. So, 1918 influenza, the influenza pandemic arrived in this particular community. This is a small isolated community in, the, in Manitoba, in the state of Manitoba in Canada. In six weeks, about 18 percent of Norway house population had died. 18 percent is large, it is close to one out of every five people. This happened in the, this is a winter epidemic. And it is a small happened in a small community of about 750 members. So, e what each member did, this is still a tractable number, you are not talking about numbers like 200,000. You knew who those members are, who were the members who went out, who stayed at home, etc. And this is unusual because much is known about the travel between the communities as well as the social cultural factors that determine the behavior of, of this particular fur traffic community. So, the idea here is to combine archival or historical information epidemiological information, ethnographic information as well as information about the biological agent to into an agent based model for disease. So, here is the Hudson Bay, this is Lake Winnipeg and here is Norway house. 
Okay. And these are the other the Oxford House, Hayes River, Gauss Lake. These are all other communities that hang around here. And there is a lot of interaction between these communities. And that's, for example, Oxford House is here, and these are the Norway House is here. Oxford House is there, and this is the ways in which people would get from each other. So over here, so this is depths of Canada in winter. So typically, you have sleds moving here, you have canoes moving in that direction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have a lot of move, movement between these different um, communities, all of which are described here. Okay. So Norway House had a combined European and indigenous population. The economy was basically centered around the fur trade and fishing. And this happens in a particular way. The way people would use the use land in this community was very seasonal. It's known that the epidemic probably came from soldiers returning from battle, and there was a three to seven day infectious period allowed for contact via travel. So you had people in the community going out and coming back, but typically they would only manifest the symptoms after three to seven days after infection. So that would give them enough time to infect other people. So dispersal on the landscape and small trapping groups, increasing mobility occurs during the winter time. So these, remember, these are communities that survive on trapping in order, so they have, they stay in, they are associated with Norway House, but you have groups of them moving outward in order to trap fur-bearing animals and then coming back. So that increased, the net increase, whereas summers people tended to stay in one place in, in their houses. So this increased mobility in the winter time and food was scarce and you cannot sustain a large population of small area gives you a very special pattern of mobility that you need to account for. And in the summer when you have more plentiful food and larger more sedentary population, you congregate in larger settlements. So it's believed that this started when the mailman delivered a packet, probably with some traces of the virus on it. And then Norway House was connected to Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3 and Camp 4. And we know now how the number of, of infected changed across these different camps. And this is how you have motion between the camps and motion out of Norway House. Here is how you had a susceptible person, you had an infected family member or non-family member infecting a susceptible person. A susceptible person could remain susceptible with some one minor property of transmission or it could become exposed. There would be a latent period <clears throat> after which the exposed person became infected and then became recovered following an infectious period here. So you could either recover or you could die in a more complicated model. And here you have the contact probability is about you must assign the contact probability with an infected individual. There's a probability of transmission in order to achieve this particular stage. So this is the epidemiology of the basic model. So as I said, susceptible, exposed, infectious, and either dead or recovered. There are there's a probability of disease transmission that influences the susceptible to exposed arrow here. And this is also influenced by the probability of contact within a family between members of different families, etc. There's a latent period that separates the exposed and the infectious. There's a recovery time and a time to death, and the probability of death that determines this. So over here, in the agent-based model, you have assimilation begins, and agents begin to move around the landscape, and it's known which agents moved where and when. So at day 20, you have a single infectious agent which is introduced into the um, the Norway House post. These agents move about the landscape, interact with each other, the epidemic spreads. This is the peak of the epidemic, so its time is in this particular direction. The epidemic ends and the simulation ends at some later time. So, this is the structure and the assumptions of the model. The grid size for the world is 100 by 100, so you can have 100 by 100 spatial description. Each simulation runs over 200 days. You average over a large number of simulations for each change of parameters. The output that you would hope to get from the simulations are how long did the epidemic last, what is the peak time of the epidemic, what is the peak number of cases of the epidemic, what is the total number of cases of the epidemic, and the percentage of the population that was infected. There are various types of input that you can get. For example, the population was 750. The male, female were about 0 0.5 and 0 0.25 0 and 0.25 between the grew age group 20 to 50 years. If you looked at male and female between less than 20 and more than 50, that's about half of the population. There were no births, no deaths in the earlier version of the model, and no migration in or out, and everybody recovered. And then a single person introduces the influence of flu into the fort on day 20. Each person belongs to a family trapping group. So there is a summer scenario and a winter scenario. In summer, everybody congregates in the same place, in the fort, and moving randomly. And the winter scenario, everyone divided between the fort and the camps, moving randomly within the designated areas. No females, elders, or children travel. Males in the fort do not travel. And this is periodically males in the camps travel to the fort, and males travel alone. So this is an example of how 
all of the ethnographic information that you know about what these individuals did, you can factor into the model. And again, this is a, the population parameters of the total number of people, contact parameters include the number of people in each family, number of families within each camp, distances that are moved, because now you can say it takes so much time for a person to move from the Norway house post to a particular camp. And there are various parameters that deal with the disease. So they said ethnographic disease, biological information, all of this you can put into this particular model. Here is a question that you could ask, could the known seasonal community structure of the Norway house people and the mobility associated have influenced the spread of the flu? What happens if they did not have this particular mobility pattern? And then you can ask, the fact that this happened in winter was it very different from what might happen in summer where the mobility patterns would have been very different and people would have tended to congregate more in a single area? And the answer is yes. And here are various scenarios where you look at summer epidemics and winter epidemics. And winter epidemics tend to be less intense with a longer duration. And summer epidemics are very intense with a shorter duration because many people are clustered together in one particular point. So this is an example of how community structure and the population movement aids the spread of an airborne um, infectious disease such as the flu. Okay, so that was two examples of agent-based models. One was a cholera example, one was a flu example based on history. There are many, many more, more detailed examples that one can use, but this is just as general background to what is what this field is concerned with. You, there is a lot of interest typically in generating synthetic populations because as I said, with the Norway house, this is now 100 years old. You can, you know who was where, where they went, who fell ill, where they were buried, etc., etc. But if you wanted to write, to have the same information on a real population that you might think, there are issues of privacy. So one way to get around that is to take data from the real population and anonymize it in some way to create, by creating a synthetic population. Either that or you work only with aggregate data and you do not report any data from which an individual could be identified. So over here, you can start with the synthetic population obtained from census and demographic data, infer a contact network from some, either if it's either guess at it or see if there is some data that is available which you can see who contacted who, who acquired information in infection from whom. So as I said, it's individuals plus networks plus spatial structure and all of these combined together that really lie at the intersection of how to make models for disease more and more realistic. That we know how diseases infect individuals and the progression of an epidemic through a population through the um, standard SIR model. But over here, you can ask much more targeted questions. If you have a population with a certain susceptibility to the disease, that may differ between, say, Taiwan and India or a country in Africa, etc. What is the progress? How does the progress of the epidemic change? How does the network structure of interaction, the social interaction within the community, how does that affect the progress of disease? How does the space, the fact that you don't have people uniformly contacting each other, but they're disposed on the landscape in a particular way, how does that affect the disease? How, finally, how do you combine individual based models, networks of interactions, spatial information to come up with really more and more realistic, tunable parameters that you can use to understand the spread of disease in a particular community. So that's all that I wanted to say. I have, this is a longish introduction to networks, really just to sort of motivate some of the terminology that I wanted to use later. The bottom line is that networks are a nice way of thinking about diseases and how they spread. It's a very powerful way. There's a whole lot of literacy that you can access. Often, both with networks and agents, what restricts you is the availability of data. It's very rarely that, like the Norway House example, you actually have people who've written down who fell ill, when they fell ill, what the progress was, etc., where they fell ill, where they moved, etc., etc., etc. So that's a special example. It's very hard to get that sort of data in in, in anything approaching real time in the first place. And the other is in any form which you can actually use in terms of a model. So all models have to make approximations at some point. Networks and agents are different in some ways and not so different in others. Network approaches can rely on a lot of literature from networks that pre-exist, how to understand networks, how to analyze them. The agent-based model is much more like Monte Carlo. So there's a different literature associated with Monte Carlo and how to speed up Monte Carlo and how to work with a very large number of agents that is available from there. And it's really a matter of choice which you prefer. And probably the best idea is to combine both networks and agents in some way to really achieve a deeper understanding of, of uh, this problem, of how to model the spread of infectious disease in realistic populations. So that's it. Thank you.